and uh, thank you all for joining. Um, uh, National Geographic Learning, our mission is to cover the world and, and all that is in it, like National Geographic. And I think with this webinar, we are doing a pretty good job in, in covering the whole world. We had people registering from, I believe, more than 80 countries, uh, from Australia to Japan to China to Malta, uh, Russia, Ukraine, Romania, Italy, United Kingdom, over to Brazil, uh, we have Oman and uh, Mexico, Colombia, United States, and many, many more. So wherever you are joining from, um, thank you very much for joining. Um, it is an honor and a pleasure to be able to speak with you. Okay, is the audio okay for most people? I think if I turn it to here, it might be clearer. Yeah, too loud. Okay, so maybe I'll to move it here. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I mean, we thought we'd start with a, a quick survey to find out uh, some uh, of your, your backgrounds or what your own teaching situation. So perhaps, Emily, if you could uh, put the first survey on. So we, we have a poll, so you can, you can just check whichever is true for you, uh, which of these options. Uh, for, in my case, my own teaching background was mainly uh, junior high school and, and senior high school in Japan and with some adult students. And so, okay, so we have nearly everybody has some experience of teaching uh, reading, uh, mostly with, uh, again, middle or high school students uh, and adult learners so, and with some primary. So hopefully the content we'll be looking at and the examples we'll look at will be useful uh, whatever your teaching situation whether it's from primary up to to adult um, the materials or the examples that we'll look at will come from this series that emily mentioned we just have a third edition out now called uh, reading explorer it's a six level series and uh, again, that series is actually used in some places in upper primary and it goes through up to adult. Okay, so let's look at what we'll be looking at. So we'll look at three main questions in this webinar. So a basic question, we'll start off, what happens when we read? And then why is reading in another language so challenging, both for teachers and for students? And how can we help ESL and, and EFL students develop effective reading skills in the class? Okay, and then we'll look at um, seven tips. And so the bulk of this web webinar, we'll look at some ideas for effective reading skills. And some of these will be familiar to you, but hopefully there'll be some ideas here you can use in your own class. So let's start with the basic question. So how do we read? What happens when we read? I'll give you a quick memory test. So I'll show a very short piece of text and uh, just think about what do you see or what, what do you read when you see it? I'll show it for three seconds. So it's very quick reading and uh, yeah, multiple people are typing. It may take a while to come through. Yeah, so trees in the forest. I mean, the, the image, I guess, gives a clue yeah, trees in the forest. So while while these responses come through, I'll show you what you actually saw it was trees in the the forest. So it was basically trees in the forest, except that there were two thes. And if you didn't spot the extra the, it's okay. Not many people do because when we read quickly, in that case, or we read fluently. Um, we often, we don't normally read word by word. Often we read in chunks of language or chunks of text. Our brain looks at it, recognizes it, decodes it, and moves on to the next chunk. So in a way you could say reading is kind of bottom up. We build up our knowledge from, from words and phrases and chunks of language. But, but what else is, is going on? I mean, it's not just a bottom-up decoding. What else is happening? 
I'll give you uh, some sentences from a paragraph that's uh, from, from one of our courses. And yeah, as you read it, just think, what or who is this paragraph about? So as you're reading that paragraph, you may be having, you may have some assumptions about what this, what this text is about. Perhaps at first you think Ushi might be a pet or a, a, a cat or a dog, or perhaps, or perhaps a child that's run away from home. And then as the information comes through, you can make assumptions and predictions and change your uh, ideas of what you're reading about. And in that way, in, this, by the way, is Ushi. Uh, this is Ushi Okushima. She's a, a real person. Or, uh, uh, she lived until she was 109 years old. She was one of the, the centenarians of, of Okinawa, one of the longest uh, living places on earth. And uh, this is her with her friends. And this paragraph is from um, book four of the Reading Explorer series, where we look at uh, the secrets of long living, uh, the, in search of longevity. And it's a good example, I think, of just how reading is not just bottom up. We're not just decoding words and phrases. We're also bringing our own kind of assumptions and guesses and um, predictions as we read. What else? Well, reading today is also increasingly non-linear. It, it's not really often in a straight line. I think. Traditionally, EL, um, course books and, and some text looked like this. There'd be a, a chunk of text and students would read left to right and top to bottom. And, but how do we read for information these days? Often it's a lot more complex. It's a lot, maybe more like this. Maybe go from a title to a short text, to a chart, to a, a, a pie chart, to um, you know, maybe a, a caption and a, and a sidebar, and then maybe a hyperlink to another another link. It's a lot more complex. It's non-linear, um, but it's also I think, multi-modal. I mean, it, it has many forms. Information today is often it's a mix of of text, but also images too. I mean, the images we we read in a way um, similar to text, really. I mean, some examples that we have in our uh, Reading Explorer series where we've included infographics like this one, um, showing natural processes or structures like the, the inside of, of King Tutankhamun's tomb. And this one, I think, is a good example of how reading increasingly is more uh, non-linear. Yeah? Your eyes go all over that spread to to get the, the ideas of what the information is telling you. So it's bottom up, top down. So it's, it's an interactive process really, and often multimodal, many forms of information integrated together to reconstruct the meaning of the original writer. So given that, if that's what's going on, so what are the main challenges of teaching reading to English language learners. I mean, it looks like nearly all of you have experience of this. It would be good to find out what your challenges are. So maybe Emily, if you could throw over the uh, the second uh, survey and let's let's see what your your main challenges have been in, in your class. And again, you can check more than one option if if that's true for you. Yep, and I can say from my experience of, of teaching some years ago, uh, reading, uh, motivation was one of the top ones and, and vocabulary. And it looks like, yeah, those are uh, two of the main ones. Lack of reading strategies as well, I can see has been a main 
um, a challenge for you. Yeah, lack of motivation. Finding the right genre as well, as Musa says, yeah. Okay, yeah, it looks like we've got some, some consensus there that perhaps the most the important challenges here are a lack of vocabulary, lack of reading strategies, and lack of motivation. And we'll be looking at each of those as we go through. So first, let's take a look at the first aspect. So how can we help our students? Let's look at seven ways, and let's try to do that in the next 40 minutes. So firstly, motivation, interest. How do we get our students interested in um, the text that they're going to read so that they can improve their reading? Some common um, aspects of, kind of motivating texts tend to be authentic, real world. Uh, they're relevant to students' interests. They're interesting and varied. But what does that mean in practice? Well, when we're developing our own reading materials, we do a lot of surveys with our, uh, with our teachers. And with Reading Explorer, it's used in over 70 countries around the world. So we have a lot of uh, people that we can uh, talk to. And we ask them a question with the, with the, um, when we did the third edition is, uh, what topics work best for your classes? And um, of all the topics uh, in all six levels, the one that came out as the most popular and the most effective was this one in, in book three, which was called Skin Deep. And it's about cultural perceptions or attitudes towards beauty and appearance. Now, what makes, what is beauty? Is beauty more than skin deep? And I think it's a good example of kind of getting the right kind of nonfiction uh, topic that works well in a class. And when we looked at our research, we basically came up with three aspects that were, were quite common to the most popular, the most effective readings. Firstly, they use a real life, authentic theme that is relevant to students. So it has some kind of meaning to them or that will have some impact on their lives, something that they may have an opinion on or that may be important to them later in their life. Often it's the, the, the readings that have some personal angle, even if it's a kind of an environmental topic or a science topic, if there's some aspect of it that's about um, the people who are involved in investigating this topic, somehow there's an easier, it's easier to make a connection. And finally, an important aspect is, is adding some mystery or at least a question to the reading text, which is, a kind of making a reason to read for the students and together these factors mean that the most effective readings have been a familiar topic where students learn something new or gain a new perspective. Um, and images are important as well for kind of getting students in, raising questions um, like how smart are animals? Are animals smart like humans? What can, hum what can some animals do that humans can do? We have this in a reading called Inside Animal Minds. This is a, an amazing photograph of an orangutan of course, in, uh, in Malaysia, I think. Um, and recently, uh, National Geographic had this, uh, this issue on uh, like kind of personal identity and race. And then we used um, images and content from that for a, a unit on identity. What makes us who we are? Um, how are we similar or different to our brothers and sisters or our parents? So getting a topic that will get students interested to read, of course, is the first foundation step. But even if it's interesting, it may not be effective if it's too difficult for students to understand. So how do we make a reading comprehensible but still useful? Let me give you an, um, two examples. Now here, which do you think is the more difficult text out of these two? 
this was uh, Mr. Greedy was a, was a, a childhood book I read many many years ago, and of course, uh, Grapes of Wrath is a famous novel by uh, John Steinbeck. So there was a readability analysis of many texts that was done uh, quite recently in the UK, and for these two. These were the results, and I think most people think Grapes of Wrath, of course, is, is more difficult, and it is slightly, according to this index. Um, it's, they're actually very similar um, in terms of uh, this readability measure, mainly because Mr. Greedy's author used quite long words and quite kind of made up words. Um, John Steinbeck used quite uh, short sentences and, and simple language, even though it's a big book. So I guess the point here is readability measures can be useful, but they're not always that reliable. And we need to use them with other um, measures. And when we're um, adapting our readings, uh, we use uh, several criteria, at least five, and, and they're the ones here. We look at sentence length. Uh, obviously, the shorter the sentence is, the, the easier it will be. Um, the passage length is important. The grammar, maybe there's uh, a lot of passive um, voice or, or um, past participles or, or difficult tenses. And the vocabulary is key. And we'll get onto that in more detail uh, later. But also the topic itself. I mean, if it's a topic that has, it's quite complex uh, with a lot of technical terms or, or very culturally specific, that can be difficult for students to understand as well. So there are many aspects of how a reading is, is difficult. And we, we look at uh, all of those when we, we adapt our material. I'll give you an example and you can see how, how we approach it. And it might be useful if you're adapting uh, texts as well. This is a, a real article. Uh, from National Geographic magazine from a few years ago on killer plants, so plants that eat uh, animals, um, like this unfortunate uh, fly at the bottom of this uh, pitcher plant. And the article uh, starts off with this quite a long paragraph, and which has quite a lot of difficult uh, vocabulary. And we can tell its complexity if we put it into an, an analyzer. And on the internet, you can find several um, sites that you could use to, to analyze readings. We usually use uh, textinspector.com, which is a useful uh, site to look at. And why it's useful is it will break it down. It will look at what vocabulary is in that uh, passage and where it falls on the CEFR uh, levels, so the Common European Framework. A1 being the easiest, the most basic words, through to C2, the, the least frequent, or and some of the words are unlisted, so they're beyond the list. So in this paragraph, we can see most of the words are basic words, like A1, A2, but we'd expect that from any text. But there's also quite a lot of B2, C1, C2 words there, and at least 16 unlisted words, words that are even beyond the CF level. And we can see uh, when we analyze it, what kind of words these are. These are you know, fleshy powder of ruddy leaf. Um, the next, unleashes enzymes, the fly's innards, the ultimate indignity. So the writer, um, as he's writing for National Geographic magazine, uh, is writing for a native reader audience and some of the vocabulary is very tough for English learners. So what do we do? Well, here's our adapted paragraph. So we, we adapted that same paragraph. We wanted to keep the same kind of approach the writer used and the same kind of uh, topic. But we reduced the length, reduced the sentence length, adapted the vocabulary, and uh, just simplified the, the content slightly. And we can see if we put this into that analyzer, all the words now are just A1, A2, B1. There's a few unlisted words there, but what are they? Nectar, which is uh, important for the topic, um, so we'll have to define it. It's difficult to paraphrase. 
and Venus flytrap, which is the name of the plant. So again, we, we need to include it. So that's that's how we adapt the the texts for the complexity to make it suitable for the level of the student. And this was our um, our adapted passage that we use in um, reading explore the foundations level. So this is the, the lowest level. And here's where we uh, have a footnote for nectar. Um, so there's many aspects to complexity. And we look at uh, one, the word count. How many words are there in the passage? In the foundations level, we might have like 260, up to 1,500 for top level. The sentence length goes up, of course, uh, from about 10 words to about 19. The reading ease goes down. Now, reading ease, uh, there's a measure called flesh reading ease, which you can get in um, Microsoft Word. If you just go to the tools and do a grammar or a spell check, it will show you the, the reading ease of your text. And that goes down because it's getting more difficult. And we adjust the vocabulary and foundations, looking more at A1, A2 level, and by the top, looking more at C1 and C2. So those are the kind of the criteria we look at um, when we're adapting texts to make them uh, comprehensible for, for students at, at lower levels. OK, so partly it's getting texts that are interesting, uh, motivating, and getting them to the right level so that the students can understand them. So then we just let them read it, right? Or there is another stage that we could, we could include, uh, the pre-reading stage. And um, there are a few ways that we could do that. Because in real life, we, we rarely read something without context. Um, we need to give the students some context before they, they read what they uh, see. So one way is to use images to kind of get uh, students interested in the reading text. Uh, an approach that you could use, is we call um, see, think, wonder. Um, here's first stage. So you have students describe what they see and you know, what's happening in the picture. What do you see? Have them think. What's happening or why is it happening? What do they wonder? What do they want to know? For example, in the, with this photo, you could say, well, I see there are people uh, sleeping on mattresses. I think there's a uh, music band or an orchestra in the corner. I think they might be at some unusual concert, <laughs> strange concert. I wonder why they're there. I wonder why they're sleeping in rows. I wonder what they're dreaming about. So I think it's quite a good way to get students to think about the topic just using the images. And you could give the sentence frames out to, to help guide the discussion. And we use that uh, photo for uh, a reading about dreams and, and understanding dreams. So images, what else? Well, we can use the title of the reading. In this case, is a reading about seeing the impossible. So we can guess it's something unusual. And then the subheadings here are all uh, questions. So are the lines straight? Cut are the squares? Are the circles moving? And it can be a way to get students into it, and then perhaps have them read the first paragraph so they get the, the, the gist of what the, the passage will be about, in this case, optical illusions. Now, I think these are so interesting that I think it's worth taking a look at these illusions. So you may have seen some of these before. So are the lines straight? Well, in this case, yes, they are. And it's the, the dots there that actually make it seem like uh, is perspective. Are the circles moving? Um, if you don't like illusions, you may want to look away from the screen. Um, 
in this case, no, they're not, because if you if you put the, the circle over, you can see they're they're not moving. And if you if students want to know the reason, then they'll want to read the paragraph. How about the squares? Are the squares which one is darker or are they same? Well, if you haven't seen this uh, illusion, uh, they're actually the same color, the squares one and two, which seems impossible. But when you look at it, you can see they are. And the reason is the shadow from the apple makes your brain think that square two is uh, lighter than it is. Anyway, you can so you can look at could use images, the title, the subheads to get them the gist of the reading. Um, you can also get them to skim through the reading. Uh, there's many ways to skim. Here's one way. You could take a section of the reading and you can tell from the title it's about threats to coral reefs. And you could have students look at the first paragraph and then just the first sentence of the other paragraphs and just by doing that they should get a, a good sense of what this this section is about we can tell it's about human activities and how they affect coral like illegal fishing cyanide fishing water pollution global warming so just by looking at the first paragraph and the first sentence of the other paragraphs we can get a sense of the whole section's uh, meaning. It can be useful if students are reading quickly, maybe in exams as well, if they need to get a, a quick idea of what this passage is about. So those are just some uh, pre-reading strategies we could use before students get into the main reading. Yes, and as uh, Chao Wei says, reading topic sentences first can, is a good way to help um, the students get the gist of, of what they're reading. So we've done some pre-reading strategies. Now we can get students into the main reading and develop their real comprehension strategies. Here I should make a distinction between extensive reading and intensive reading. Now extensive reading, as many of you know, we, uh, is more about reading for pleasure, really, reading lots of material, not worrying about the language or the grammar, and it's just developing your reading fluency. And graded readers, for example, are, are very good for that. Intensive reading is really more for developing reading skills and strategies and focused strategies. And that could be useful, especially for when you're doing research or for, or also just for taking exams as well. Um, and Reading Explorer is one of our series that focuses mostly on intensive reading. So students develop some key comprehension strategies. So let's do an example with a very short text. And this is just an 85 word uh, paragraph. And I'll just give you a minute to just read through. Uh, and as you're reading, you can think, how would you use this to develop uh, your students reading skills or, or even or just their language skills as well. Okay, so let's take a look. So we, we can use that text for at least 12 different ways. And I think, yeah, we have some people typing in some suggestions here. And one way would be just to get them to answer, focus on what's the gist of the reading? What's the purpose? It's basically about a, a man on his way to work and what happens to him. Sorry, what would be a good title for it, perhaps? You know, a bad day at work. I suppose. Yeah, a man who's late for work. 
um, you could have students look at the main idea. How would they describe what happens in the passage in a sentence, perhaps? A man drives to work and gets stuck in the traffic and uh, his boss gets angry, perhaps. And yes, you could say the purpose might be to say, listen to your wife always. Identifying key details would be uh, perhaps the next step, either the who, what, where, why, when and, and why of uh, the, the passage. When did it happen? Yesterday. Who is the driver? Probably a teacher. We're not sure, but probably. Uh, where did he go? To school. You could have them put the events in sequence. I mean, in this case, you know, he left home, it started raining, uh, the meeting started, he arrived at work, boss got angry. How do we know? Then you could have students look at the, the signposting words for for sequencing, like soon after or when I got. So as sequencing, you could look at cause and effect, the why questions. Why was the boss angry? Because the guy met, missed the meeting. Why did he miss it? Because the traffic was bad and so on. And then use that passage to kind of look at some of the language that the writer used. You might have seen there's several examples of, of collocations with uh, take take a shortcut, take an hour and a half, take a train. So you could ask students, how long does it take them to get to school? Or introduce some other collocations with tape. There may be some words and phrases there that the students are not familiar with. Chucking it down is actually a British English expression, which you can probably guess is, uh, Oh, somebody says go back to five. There you go. That's number five. If somebody wanted to see it. So chucking it down, um, they may be able to guess from the context that it's raining. And he says at the end, uh, Baxter will kill me. Does he really mean it? It's more of a figurative expression. So perhaps students could guess what does he really mean? Maybe Baxter will get angry or will kind of scold him. Reference as well, you could look at, like especially pronouns. He says, it didn't make any difference. What didn't make any difference? What, is there a clue in the sentence? And then students could look earlier in the sentence to find out what the it refers to. So making connections between the pronouns and the reference. As well as reference, Often writers uh, use ellipsis, so that means that you know, they, they miss out uh, certain words and you have to kind of infer what they mean. Like he says, I can't afford to miss tomorrow's as well. What does he mean? Well, probably he's referring to the staff meeting. So we have to make a connection between that sentence and a previous sentence. And finally, in this section, we could look at some of the grammar aspects of the of the passage, like the, the when clauses, when it's wet, the roads are, when he got to work, his boss got angry, or if for conditionals. And here we get into making predictions. If he misses the next meeting, what will happen? And here we get into more higher order thinking skills. And it's useful as well with just a a single text to look at not only the basic comprehension and language skills, but also the higher order skills. So what are some examples? Well, this is a framework that uh, one of our authors, uh, John Hughes, who has done several other webinars that are, are well worth watching. He developed this based on a framework that was adapted from Bloom's Taxonomy, which many of you may be familiar with, which looks at a range of thinking skills going from basic comprehension skills, like remembering, uh, understanding, all the way through to more creative, or sorry, critical and then creative thinking skills. So what are some examples of, say, critical thinking we could look at? And with that text about the, the teacher, you could look at who is Baxter? Uh, we, we're not sure, but he's probably the, the school principal, or she is the school principal. What kind of person is he or she? It could be. How about the writer? What do we know about him? What kind of relationship do they have? 
or making judgments, evaluations. Who is right in this situation? Um, who do you have sympathy for? Maybe maybe you you sympathise with uh, with the writer or with Baxter or maybe with the the writer's wife who is telling him, "Don't drive, take the train." He's like, "No, no, no, I, I know what I'm doing." Or maybe you know a personal reaction or, or a prediction that students could make. You know, have you ever had a, an experience like this? Perhaps. Some people on this webinar may have experienced a situation like that, the writer, uh, what happened, and, or to have it lead to a more kind of creative writing task or speaking task. So that's with all the, the reading passages in, in our uh, Reading Explorer series, we try to include a whole range of uh, reading skills and thinking skills through from basic comprehension through to creative thinking and you can do that even with the foundation level uh, readings all the way from looking at sequencing cause and effect and looking at analyzing and applying language patterns inferring making judgments evaluations all the way through to more creative and personal responses um, here's an example. This is, well, as you can guess, this is a great white shark with a, with a couple of brave divers. Um, this is a, a reading we have which asks, what is the truth about the great white sharks? And what are the myths? And we, after the reading, we have students look at many aspects of that reading, the gist, purpose, through to the, the details, the referencing, um, analyzing fact and speculation, comparing the text against the um, the map as well, because there's the, a lot of information there in the map. Um, looking at the language patterns, in this case, uh, uh, signal words for contrasting relations, and then more critical thinking tasks. Where this reading is looking at why do uh, great white sharks occasionally attack humans? What are the reasons? And they're looking at the evidence for and against different, different arguments. So that's a, kind of the range of, of skills that uh, we could cover, even with a, a, a small text like that one. Um, but as we saw earlier with that survey, one of the key challenges that students have, of course, is with vocabulary, and especially with dealing with new vocabulary as they're reading. So let's look at some examples of, of what we can do to help um, students when they when they find difficult words. So here's a, you, you may know where this illustration comes from. It's from a famous uh, children's book from some years ago, and it was made into a film. Uh, just there's a clue. Yeah, it's the BFG by Roald Dahl, and Dahl was quite famous for using uh, uh, strange new words as, as he's writing. So here's a here's a passage from that book. Here is the repulsant snozcumber, cried the BFG, waving it about. I squoggle it, I despise it, I despunge it, but because I is refusing to gobble up human beings like the other giants, I must spend my life guzzling up icky poo snozcumbers instead. So there are words there that obviously are not real English words, but we can probably guess what they mean. Like repulsant, for example. Just from reading that text, we can guess it probably means, uh, yeah, B, disgusting. Yeah. How about uh, snozcumber? What kind of thing would it be? In this case, it's probably a vegetable. Yeah, some seeds coming in, I think. And the picture is a good uh, clue to that. And misspies we can guess, is a verb because he misspies it. So what could it mean? Yep, and there are some A's coming in. Yeah, he hates it. So what's going on here? So we can we can understand those words even though they don't exist. So something is helping us guess the the unfamiliar vocabulary. Well, there's probably two aspects at least. We're using context. We're guessing the meaning from the context, including the picture. Yeah, the context clues, as the lady says, by our knowledge of 
word parts as well, and we'll look at that. For example, uh, Miss Spies, we can guess, is, is a negative uh, verb, and uh, mainly with the, because of the prefix Miss. Let's uh, look at the first aspect, this getting um, meaning from context. I mean, why do it? You could look up everything in a dictionary, but it's, it's going to slow a student down. Um, it's not going to help with their fluency. And research suggests with 90 to 95% of words that you know, you can still get a good understanding of the passage. So context clues can help. Um, here's an example from a reading. We have a, a passage about uh, so the UNESCO um, heritage. And many of you will know the World Heritage Sites, uh, from Stonehenge, the Taj Mahal, uh, Machu Picchu. Um, but you may not know UNESCO also has a list of what they call intangible heritage, which uh, they're not buildings, they're things like cultural rituals or, or dances or, or traditional ceremonies. Um, and since 2010, UNESCO also includes important regional cuisines. Now, if a student is reading that passage, they might get to cuisine and uh, think, I don't know what it is. They could look it up in a dictionary, yeah. Or they can carry on reading, and from the context of that paragraph, they probably get that it means something to do with food and drink, and just because of the examples there. And it's something to do with regional, so it's probably food and drink from certain places or certain areas. Um, and this UNESCO site actually is very interesting. If you look online, you'll be able to see um, what uh, intangible heritage has been listed for your own country. I mean, things from Korean kimchi, uh, Mexican Day of the Dead ceremony, uh, many, many cultural aspects around the world. So this is how we uh, cover it in, in Reading Explorer, looking at the, the, um, the words that students may not know, but they may get from the context. And yeah, you can look up words in a dictionary, of course, but you may still need the context to know which meaning in the dictionary is correct. Um, I'll show you a, a headline from a recent uh, newspaper article um, in Singapore, my, where I live, um, Joel Sartori. Photographer Joel Sartori is halfway through quest to shoot every species in captivity. So what's the headline mean? So someone who is an English language learner may not know what the word shoot is as a verb. So if they look it up in a dictionary, there's a couple of options. So there's two interpretations of what this headline is about. Either uh, Joel Sartori is on a kind of global rampage to uh, kill every animal he can get his hands on, or more likely it's number two. So he's, he's going around the world uh, taking photographs uh, of, of species in captivity. So, okay, maybe it's a slightly silly example, but it's a good uh, case of, of how the context can be vital for understanding which dictionary definition is the, the most relevant. And if you haven't seen Joel Sartori's photos, you could look in uh, this month's uh, National Geographic uh, magazine, which is this one, um, has a whole feature of his, his photos like this one. Well, and we've included some of his uh, photo arc images in Reading Explorer, like this adorable slow loris, which is from uh, Vietnam. So context is, is helpful um, for getting the meaning of unfamiliar words, getting the right dictionary definition, um, but sometimes it's not enough and students may need also some knowledge of word roots and affixes. These can be very useful. And I think some people already in the chat room have, have mentioned some examples of this. Let's, I mean, take a word like unpredictable. Um, there's you could break it up into four parts, and you've got a prefix, meaning not, uh, pre, another prefix, before, dict, which relates to saying. And students may know predict, um, so at least they would know what predict means to, 
to say something before it happens and able to you can so it means uh, unpredictable really means not before say can but if you say it like that you end up sounding a bit like yoda you know, mm, not before say can which is not really um very good way to to, to talk um, so it's good that we have words like unpredictable. So it's useful for um, students to, to know some of these useful prefixes and suffixes and uh, giving out some, some lists of, of prefixes and, and suffixes like these uh, can be a great resource for, for students. It's not always going to help them because prefixes have different meanings, um, but it can be a useful tool for them. Um, in later levels of Reading Explorer, and, and I, th I think somebody in the chat room uh, may refer to some of these, like the, the Greek and the Latin roots. Um, these can be useful, um, especially for higher levels. And uh, for example, there's, there's one that we, that's missing there, number seven, just from the examples of, of audience, auditory, uh, auditorium, um, we can guess it probably has something to do with uh, sound or hearing. So uh, it can be useful to, with that knowledge of, of word parts and the meanings, the knowledge of prefixes and suffixes, and their, um, their techniques for guessing from context. Um, it can really help students to, to deal with vocabulary so they don't have to look it up in a dictionary each time. So with just uh, maybe five minutes left, the final aspect of it, once, once students have, have read and analyzed the text, um, it can be useful for them to summarize it in uh, graphic organizers. Um, or you could give the graphic organizer to the students and they're taking notes as they are reading. So these can be really good for, for note taking skills. And there are many types. Um, you probably use some of these in class already, these uh, like T-charts, uh, Venn diagrams, uh, uh, process diagrams, uh, timelines, uh, concept maps, um, tables, just simple tables, especially for, for readings about uh, classification. So for example, that uh, article about the killer plants, um, it, a lot of that is about the process, the natural process of how the, the plant uh, catches its prey. So there, a process diagram might be useful. The article about dreams is looking at different types of dreams. So it's more kind of um, suitable for a concept map. And a concept map, the, the, the circles there would be the main topics. And then the, the squares coming out are the, the details that relate to each topic. Uh, if you remember that big flying dinosaur we looked at earlier, the pterosaur, um, the earliest fossils for those were found by a woman who was uh, living in the south of England named Mary Anning over a hundred years ago. And we have a, an article about her, called The Secrets in the Sand. That's more of a biography, uh, a profile. So in that case, probably a timeline would be a more useful way for students to, to note the key events. And with the new edition for Reading Explorer, we have um, we created graphic organizers for all every unit of, of every level. So these will be um, on our website and, and teachers will be able to, to download that if it's useful for class. And the, these are some examples. So just to summarize, here are the seven you know, keys for, for effective reading that we've looked at. One is just to get real life motivating text, something that students will be interested in and will find relevant. Adapt the text to the right level. And there are many ways that we can, we can do that from sentence length through to topic complexity. Uh, develop their pre-reading skills, which would include looking at uh, using the images, headings, text clues, as well as basic skimming techniques. Building a range of uh, comprehension strategies, and we looked at uh, about 12 or no, about 10 of those uh, from basic 
um, through to kind of more advanced kind of analyzing skills and more higher order uh, critical thinking uh, skills as well. Vocabulary, we looked at the, the two main aspects, looking at dealing with uh, new words through guessing from context and also looking at word parts and affixes. And finally, developing note-taking skills using uh, some graphic organizers is one way that's, that can really help students um, to remember what they've read as well. So hopefully, I'm, I'm sure many of, of these you know, you've probably been familiar with in your classes, but I hope there's at least a few ideas there that you may be able to apply when you're um, in your class and developing your, your reading skills among your students. So I really um, thank you very much. And also for your contributions. I'm trying to keep track of some of the questions. I know Emily's added some. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a question about the prefixes that may have meanings that are completely different. Um, they're sometimes useful prefixes, but some, many of them have uh, different, like in doesn't always mean um, you know, negative. Or, so the students would need to know it, they're not always a, a simple you know, meaning. There are many, some of them have many meanings. Okay, yeah, no, I, mean, I think um, if you are interested in the slides, I think Emily will explain um, how you can obtain those. I really uh, appreciate your contributions and your time. Thank you very much for coming, which whatever time zone you are in. And um, yeah, I appreciate it very much. Good luck in your classes. And I'll hand over to, to Emily. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean, and thank you all for joining today. I really hope that you found this session useful um, and have some interesting takeaways to use in your classroom. Uh, I see a few questions about the slides, the recording, the certificate. Those will all be sent to you within three business days of this session. Uh, just so you know, we do have a second session later on today. It's in about um, 11 hours from now, and that will be led by Chris Street, who's another editor of uh, the Reading Explorer series that Sean went through today. Um, just a little bit more on Reading Explorer. Um, it is a six-level series uh, that prepares learners for academic success with highly visual, motivating National Geographic learning content that features real people, places, and stories. Um, if you do visit the website, there's a great video actually by Sean about what's new in the new edition of Reading Explorer. So I'll just put the link on here now. Um, and I see a question from Giovanni about the certificate. It will arrive to the email that you registered to the session uh, with. So we'll be sending that in about three business days. If you do not receive it, you can always contact us at ngl.webinars at cengage.com. Just typing that in here now. Great. Um, and last but not least, we do have yep several other webinars coming up. I see a question about that right now. Um, in the chat box. We have about four or five in October for teaching adults, uh, for academic uh, sessions, as well as young learners and teens. And we also have one with a National Geographic, a National Geographic fellow, David Harrison, and he's a linguist. And that's all about exploring endangered languages. That will be a really great session. Um, they all will be, but that's one we're really, really excited about. So definitely be sure to register. They are on our website, NGL. Um, or excuse me, eltngl.com backslash webinars. And then we also invite you to follow our blog for Teachers of English too. It's a lot of similar useful content and is related mostly to sessions um, that we present in webinars. All right, um, and then definitely take a, some time to follow us on social media for updates. Um, and thank you for joining us today. I'll be sending you along to the survey now to get some feedback about this session. And please let us know yeah, what your feedback is on that. Um, I see a question about uh, the certificate. So again, we will be sending that to the email address that you've registered with. And if you have any problems, you can always contact us at ngl.webinars.com. That's engage.com, excuse me. 
All right. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Hope you have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, or evening, whatever time it is where you are. And thank you again, Sean, for this session. I'm sorry about my connection, everyone. <laughs>